Hello, I'm Derek Walker, the pastor of the Oxford Bible Church, and we're in a series on the baptism in the Spirit. Today we're talking about releasing the blessing of the Spirit by sowing the seed of God's Word. One of the key concepts in the Bible is the blessing of God, the impartation of God's Spirit to man, giving him life. And this blessing is spiritual in nation, nature. So to be blessed is to have God's life working within and upon us. We were made to live in and under the power of God's blessing. And it, that causes us to live and thrive and be fruitful. The opposite of blessing is curse, which is the absence of life or, or death. Whereas righteousness is the foundation for blessing, sin cuts us off from the blessing and brings us under the curse. In Adam, we were all under the curse because of sin, but Christ, through his death and resurrection, he's provided a righteousness for us, his righteousness as a free gift, so that in Christ we can stand in his righteousness and receive his blessing of life. This blessing of God is made available in the new covenant in Christ through the Holy Spirit, and this blessing is called the promise of the Spirit. It's also called the blessing of Abraham because God promised it first to Abraham and the new covenant really is the fulfillment of the blessing aspect of the Abrahamic covenant. We were saved by the blessing or the grace of God. When we received Christ, this blessing of the Holy Spirit came into us and recreated our spirit and we were born again and we become children of God. Our dead spirit came alive with the life of Christ and the blessing that is, the Holy Spirit came to dwell and live within us. But there's also a second blessing of the Spirit. In other words, there are two parts to the complete blessing of God. The first blessing is the Spirit within us, and the second blessing is the Spirit upon us, empowering us to multiply ourselves and be fruitful. We receive this second blessing through the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And this is a reflection of a fundamental principle throughout Scripture based on the very nature of reality that the blessing of God is always of this twofold nature. Number one, the blessing within us that sustains our own life. And secondly, the blessing upon us which empowers us to be fruitful and multiply and reproduce ourselves. And this ability to multiply is a characteristic of all life and so is necessarily part of God's blessing for us. We see this truth in the initial blessing of creation of living things uh, when, they, when God blessed them at their creation. And that blessing is still at work in the earth today, causing living things, plants, animals to live and multiply. Let's see this. First of all, God created the plant kingdom and blessed the plants and trees with life. And then he also blessed them with the power to reproduce. That's Genesis 1.11. God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yields seed, that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. You see, in this passage, God emphasizes the importance of seed. In this message, I am pointing to the vital connection between the second blessing, that is the power, the blessing to multiply oneself, and with seed. And of course, we understand that you can be blessed, but you have to sow the seed. The seed has to be planted, and then the blessing has to act on the seed to produce that fruit. That You need the two together. We see it's the blessing working through the seed that produces multiplication. The blessing is the spiritual power. The seed is the natural thing that the blessing acts upon to produce new life. The blessing is not productive apart from the seed. And so the blessing is only released through the sowing of seed. And that's a vital truth. Also, the seed is ineffective if it's not empowered by the blessing. So both are needed together. Notice also how God released the blessing upon them. It says, God said. He did it by sowing his seed, by speaking the words of life. Next, we see the creation of blessing on the fish and birds. It says, God said, 
Again, he releases the blessing through his words. Then God said, Let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And here we see the first blessing upon them. They were created and blessed with life, enabling them to function, to, to fly, to swim. But without the second blessing, they would soon die out. They'd go extinct. So next we see God release the second blessing upon them. He says in verse 22, And God blessed them, saying... Notice that's how God blesses, with his words. He releases the blessing with his words. He said, Be fruitful and multiply, uh, and uh, let the birds, let the fish multiply in the waters, in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. Notice they were already blessed with life in them, but now God imparts the second blessing on them, the power to be fruitful and multiply. Now this time he doesn't directly mention seed, but the, but we know, of course, that like plants, that animals have seed within them, and thereby they can multiply themselves through this second blessing. But it's not automatic, because the blessing is only released, and multiplication only happens where if they are obedient to God's command to be fruitful and multiply, that is, by sowing their seed. The power of the blessing, then, is only released through the sowing of seed. Again, we see this is a reflection of the nature of God himself, because he is the blessed God who releases his blessing upon them. How? By sowing the seed of his word. It says, God bless them, saying, be fruitful and multiply. That's how he releases the blessing. Again, we see that God's blessing goes forth through his words, through his seeds. His spirit works with his word. And that's the key to releasing God's blessing. God is blessed, but only releases his blessing through sowing his seed. And so if we are blessed and we're baptized with the Holy Spirit, we still have to sow the seed of the word for that blessing to be released, for that power to be fulfilled. We see the same truths in the creation and blessing of the land animals. It says, Then God said, Let the earth bring forth a living creature according to its kind, according to its seed. Cattle and the creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind, according to its seed. And it was so. God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind, according to its seed. And God saw that it was good. This is how God wanted things to be. Again, you see, God releases the blessing of life upon the animals and empowers them to multiply themselves according to their kind, their seed. So the seed is necessary with the blessing of God. And so with his blessing upon them, empowering them, when they sow their seed, they multiply themselves by bringing forth new life. Again, God released his blessing upon them through the sowing of the seed of his word. And then finally we come to the creation of man, which again reveals the same twofold blessing. First of all, he created man and blessed him with life. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. And so because he's made in uh, man's, uh, God's image, that means he operates in the blessing the same way that God does. How? By sowing the seeds of his words. He releases life. We see this first blessing in more detail in Genesis 2. It says, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath or the spirit of life. And man became a living soul. This is the first blessing, making him come alive, imparting his spirit of life within man. And then that's when man came alive. But that wasn't the end, because man had a second blessing too. It says in the next verse, in Genesis 1.28, Then God, after creating them, it says, Then God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion. And so, then, so secondly, he blessed Adam, who already had the Spirit within him, by putting the Spirit upon him, by blessing him, empowering him, to impart the blessing of life to others. And we were born through that blessing. 
and that we receive that life, the blessing of Adam. Praise God. And uh, first, notice, Adam was blessed within himself at his creation or his birth. Then he received the blessing of God upon him to be a blessing, empowering him to be fruitful and multiply. In other words, it's the power to communicate life to others and to exercise dominion. God's twofold blessing of man through Adam at his creation is parallel to his twofold blessing of us through Christ in the new creation. See, number one, at our new birth, corresponding to Adam's creation, God breathed the, his spirit within us, imparting eternal life to our spirit, changing us from death to life. This is the new birth, recreating our spirit. He released this blessing to us through the words of the gospel, the seed. Then secondly, there's a second blessing. When we're baptized in the Spirit, God puts his, the blessing of the Spirit upon us. And this empowers us to multiply. It empowers us to impart the blessing of life to others, to be fruitful and multiply. We release this second blessing, again, by sowing our seed, that is, the words of the gospel. And so this twofold blessing of the new creation follows the same pattern as man's original creation. Just as the blessing of the original creation is powerful, it's still in the earth today, causing men and women to come alive and, and reproduce, um, so the blessing of the Spirit in the new creation is powerful, causing people to come alive in Christ all the time as we share the gospel with them. And so in both the original creation and the new creation, God released his blessing, his Spirit, through his words, his seed showing that the blessing of God is voice activated. That's an important principle. We are made in God's image, and so we release his blessing in the same way as God. We must, God is blessed, so we must be, first of all, blessed. We, we must have the Spirit upon us, and we must have seed to sow, because then when we sow that seed, we release the blessing of life to others. And so the Word and the Spirit work together to make us fruitful. Now we go forward to Abraham because there's a special blessing of Abraham. Uh, he received a twofold blessing from God because God said to him, I will bless you, that's the first blessing, and you will be a blessing. He'll be empowered to be a blessing to others. That's the second blessing. And then it says, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. In other words, through Abraham, that blessing will be transmitted of life and salvation to all the families of the earth. Notice the first part of the blessing is for Abraham himself, and the second part is God's blessing on Abraham to be a blessing, to enable him to transmit the blessing of God to others. And later God clarified how that was to be accomplished, because he said, Blessing I will bless you, in your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Again we see the blessing of life is transmitted through the seed. And this was partially fulfilled through his first son, Isaac, but it was completely fulfilled through his greater son, the greater than Isaac, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the seed of Abraham. The blessing that was originally promised to Abraham was ultimately fulfilled through Christ, who received the full blessing of God within himself and upon himself on our behalf in order to freely give it to us in grace through the new covenant. And so the twofold blessing of the Spirit within upon us and upon us that's in the new covenant was initially promised to Abraham. Therefore, it is called the blessing of Abraham. And it's also called the promise of the Spirit. And the verses that bring all of this together is in Galatians 3, which says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles, that's us, in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. This tells us that the promised blessing of the Holy Spirit was made possible by the death and resurrection of Christ and is now freely available to all of us through faith in Christ. We saw that this blessing of Abraham, this promise of the Spirit, is twofold. Number one, it's blessing for ourselves and our own life through the Spirit within us. And secondly, it's a, the blessing to be a blessing 
to others through the Spirit upon us. And so this blessing of Abraham includes both the new birth and the baptism in the Holy Spirit. The fulfillment of the promise to Abraham that would happen through the Messiah was more fully explained in a number of Old Testament prophecies of the twofold ministry of the Spirit in the New Covenant. Again, the Spirit within us at the new birth, and secondly, the Spirit upon us at the baptism in the Spirit. For instance, the Spirit within was prophesied by Ezekiel. God said, I put a new Spirit within you, and I will put my Spirit within you and cause you to walk in my ways. And secondly, Joel prophesied the Spirit would also be poured upon all believers through the baptism in the Spirit. He said it will come to pass afterward, I will pour out my Spirit upon upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your old men dream dreams, your young men see visions. And so another prophecy of the new covenant describes how this blessing is to be transmitted from person to person, from generation to generation, by, by two things. Number one, by the Spirit upon us and released through the, our words of faith. Isaiah 59 says, The Redeemer will come to Zion and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, says the Lord. This speaks about Christ himself, the Redeemer, coming to Israel, to Zion, to redeem us and to establish a new covenant in his blood. And then it describes how this covenant is transmitted. As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them, my spirit who is upon you, and my words which I put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor the mouth of your descendants, or the mouth of your descendants' descendants, says the Lord, from this time and forevermore. Jesus, our example and pioneer, he, as the seed of Abraham, he received the full blessing of Abraham, this twofold promise of the Spirit, uh, he functioned in that in his life and ministry. He shows what it's like to be a man operating in the fulfilled blessing of Abraham, the spirit within him and upon him. Uh, so his, his life is a pattern for us because, number one, he was born of the spirit. He had the spirit within him from birth, enabling him to live that perfectly holy life as a man before God. And then when he was 30, he was baptized in the Holy Spirit and that's when he received the Spirit upon him, which supernaturally empowered him for ministry, to do miracles and healing and preach the gospel, be a blessing to others. Again, in, in Luke 3, it says that when Jesus was baptized, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. He already had the Spirit within him, but now he received the Spirit upon him. And then he started preaching and declaring that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He only started doing that after his baptism. It wasn't true before. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he said, because he's anointed me. For what? To preach the gospel. Again, we see this, the anointing upon is connected to the speaking of words. Because the, to preach the gospel, to speak the word, releases that power and life to others. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to, to the captives. So notice the purpose of the Spirit upon him was power, to, to minister life and deliverance and healing, freedom, power to bless others. And um, that power was primarily released through his words, by preaching, by proclaiming the gospel. He was sent by God on a mission and uh, authorized to preach God's word. And he was anointed with the Spirit upon him to empower him so that the blessing of life was released through his words. And he's our example. Because he, he said, as the Father has sent me, so I sent you. So he gives us the very same mission that he was on to bless others through the gospel. Now it's baton has been given to us. And so he, he gives us the same mission and he gives us the same Spirit upon us and we release this power of the Spirit through speaking his words. You know, we see that in Acts chapter 1. It says that he commanded them to wait for the promise of the Father, for you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And then he says, you will receive power. That's the word dunamis, which is potential energy. You receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the Spirit coming upon us. 
And it says, and you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Here we see that the promise of the Spirit, or the promise of the Father to give us his Spirit, includes the baptism in the Spirit, which involves the Spirit coming upon us to empower us to be his witnesses. And so the purpose of the Spirit upon us is to give us power to witness. And this power is only released through our witness, through our words. The power of the gospel is the power of God to salvation. The gospel releases the power of God. And so the power, notice, is in the form of dunamis, potential energy, which we only activate and release when we open our mouth in faith and witness to Jesus, speak his word, share the gospel. Then this power goes forth with our words, causing them to be powerful and effectual in their hearts. And so if we have the Spirit upon us, but we are not sufficiently committed to his mission, and so we fail to speak his word, we do not release the rivers of blessing to others. That power is only potential energy. We must activate it by our words. On the other hand, if we have the word in our heart and we are willing to share it, but haven't yet received the spirit upon us, our words will lack life and power because they won't be spoken under the power of the spirit. So we need both the word and the spirit to be effective. We need first to have the word in our heart and we must be willing to speak it. And secondly, we must have the spirit upon us to empower our spoken words. So they penetrate into men's hearts with illuminating, convicting power. You see, the words of God are like missiles which we launch from our mouth. The only difference is they they contain life rather than death and they explode into people's hearts with life. But the missile, for the missile to reach the target, which is the heart of man, and for it to be effective, there must be a source of power that is activated and released at the launching site when the missile is launched, which is then able to propel the missile to its destination. When you have received the Spirit upon you, then that power source is in place. So that when you launch God's word from your mouth in faith, you activate and you release the power of the Spirit, which then goes forth with your words, empowering them and propelling them into the heart of men. Praise God. In Matthew 13, Jesus described what his ministry was all about. He gave the parable of the sower as the first and foundational parable, describing how the kingdom of God works and grows and spreads in this age. He compared it to the sower who sows the word of God in men's hearts. If people receive his word, the seed will produce new life in them. Then, when Jesus was baptized in the Spirit, he became the first sower, and he spoke God's word with the Spirit upon him. He released the power of the Spirit with his words, bringing life to men. As he said in John 6, it's the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. See how the spirit and the spoken word work together. He then commanded us all to go and and, um, continue his mission by sowing his word in the same power of his spirit. So he has provided us his word and his spirit so we can do this. In fact, we were all born again through someone sowing the seed of God's word in our heart. And God's word, spirit then work with his word to enlighten us and save us. As it says in Peter, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel is preached to you. See, the Jews knew that there were two things necessary for for fruit, for a harvest. You need the seed and you need the water, you need the rain. In scripture, rain was a symbol of the spirit or blessing of God which falls from heaven and waters the earth. Seed without rain stays dormant and also rain without seed cannot produce new life. So as they sowed their seed, they also prayed for the rain to fall. And likewise, the heart of man needs two things in order to believe and receive God's life. It needs the seed of the word of God, and it needs the rain of the spirit of God. So we need to receive the spirit upon us so that when we sow the seeds of the gospel, they go forth in the power of the spirit. The spirit energizing our words so that they penetrate the hearts of men, bringing faith and light and life to them. 
In other words, as we speak his word under the anointing, they not only receive the word into their heart, but also the reign of the Spirit flows to them, activating it. And Jesus described how the Spirit upon us is like living water flowing out of us, empowering our seed, empowering our words. He said in John 7, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And this describes receiving the Spirit within us. And then he goes on to the second blessing. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart, literally his womb, will flow rivers of living water. This he spoke about the Spirit. Now these rivers describe the Spirit upon us being activated and flowing out to others, imparting life to them. Notice they flow out of our heart. Now, this translation is valid, it is our heart, but the word used is not the usual word for heart, it's the word for womb, the place where the seed abides. So Jesus is again describing how we release the power of the Spirit. You know, he's, how do we release the power of the Spirit upon us? In order to bless others. First, we must receive and possess God's word in the spiritual womb of our heart. Then, as we speak forth his word, giving our testimony, witnessing to Christ, sharing the gospel. As we speak, we release the rivers of the Spirit that go forth with our words to confirm the word and impart blessing and life to their hearts. So it is by sowing God's seed, his word, that we release his blessing, his spirit and his power, which we carry upon us if we're baptized in the Spirit, so that it then is activated, goes forth and blesses others with God's eternal life. So we need to embrace God's mission and receive his power to fulfill it. To fulfill the Great Commission, we need both his word in our heart and his spirit upon us. When we receive the spirit upon us in the baptism of the spirit, he empowers us to witness. That is, he empowers us to speak for him with boldness so that when we sow our seed, the spirit flows. Up, the spirit upon us flows forth with the spoken word, causing it to be effectual in producing fruit in people's hearts and lives. We all need healing at some point in our life and we need to know how to receive healing from God. And so I've written this book, Getting Healed, to really help you understand how you can receive healing from God and how to help others also receive healing from God. And it's available in book form and it's also available as a CD series and it will really build your faith to encourage you to 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 receive God's healing power into your body. Thank you for watching. You can watch more of our teachings on our Oxford Bible Church Roku channel and Derek Walker YouTube channel. You're most welcome to join us at our church services which are every Sunday at 11 a.m. and 6 p.m. at Cheney School, Headington, Oxford, OX3 7QH.